The Global Energy Leaders Podcast, Episode 67. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you today. We bring on Kyle Souza from LandlineNews.com, and we talk about a kind of a wide variety of what's going on in the industry and you know what, what LandlineNews.com is. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Kyle Souza. Well, Kyle, it's been a while since I first met you back at NAEP earlier this year, but it's good to talk to you again. How's it going? Uh, it's going pretty well here for me. Okay, well, let's kind of let's talk about NAEP real quick. Um, that's where we met at, and uh, we've been trying to get you on the show for a little while now and finally have lined out the schedules. Um, I, I did a review of NAEP, and, and one of the things I took away from my NAEP experience, which was, which was my first one, the, the beautiful thing I thought about NAEP was um, that you had a booth and I was walking around as a media member, but as, a, as someone just walking around the floor, I could walk around and I could see, okay, if there's, let's say, acreage that is in a certain area, and there's you know three or four booths spread out across the floor that have that similar area, um, acreage in that similar area, and there's a lot of traffic at those booths, well, I know that the people who are doing deals are interested in that. Whereas if I saw booths that, that had very light traffic, mm, maybe not where I want to focus my efforts at. That was my biggest takeaway was from Naples, and I could go and find information that you just can't Google. You could actually see where people were interested at. What was your biggest takeaway? I mean, that's 100% accurate. You do easily get to see what parts of the country and what technologies people are interested in, uh, as opposed to sitting behind Google and searching for stuff that, frankly, a lot of time isn't online, because you got a lot of people that just do NAEP. They don't post this stuff on websites or anything like that. For me, my takeaway with this NAEP was that it was the industry is doing better than it has been. I've been going to NAEP every year for the last 10 years, and this one was much better attended and, and much better trafficked than the last two. And I just saw that as a positive sign. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it was, as far as attendance goes, I was blown away. There was a lot of people there. Now, I, I didn't go last year. I heard, uh, I did hear last year was kind of a down year. I looked at going two, three years ago and just never really worked out. But I'm excited. I'm going to uh, going to Summer Nape. Are you going to go as well? Uh, I will be attending at Summer Nape. Okay. Okay. And you guys may or may not have a booth. You're not really decided yet, right? Right, right. We may or may not have a booth. Okay. Well, um, I'm sure they'll be posted on landlinenews.com, and we'll talk about that in a second, if you guys are going to be there or not. But let's just step back. Let's just kind of talk about um, the upstream industry. You know, what are you hearing? I, I, I've kind of been torn because it seems like right now in the industry, there's a lot of talk, and, and you can't really get a grasp on what people are feeling. Some people are really confident this administration is going to kind of balance it out, and it's going to be good prosperity. Some people are extremely worried that we may see prices in the high to mid-30s, and some people are saying that, hey, we're going to get 70, 75 by the end of the year. It, 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 it's hard for me as someone just trying to get a feel. I got my own thoughts, but just trying to get a feel of where the industry's at. It's really hard to figure out, is it, is it, is it bearish? Is it bullish? You know, what are you hearing? Well, it is all over the board. I even had a newsletter in my inbox from somebody else last week where they had one article about oil going up and one article saying that to go the lowest, it, it, even low 44. Right. And that was in the same newsletter. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, people are very uncertain. There is a very positive feeling, though, because of the uh, current administration at the federal level. And I, I think people are being hopeful with that. But me, I am being more reserved on the cautious side because uh, I don't – I do think that oil will go up, but I don't think it's going to go up very quickly. And I think that a lot of people are, are tending towards that mentality, that yes, it will go up, things uh, are looking more positive, but we're not completely out of the weeds as far as it is uh, going to stay low for a little bit longer. You know, I think the biggest thing that I've seen that has been encouraging from my standpoint was um, last year, I would see posts on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or wherever, and they would talk about oil's going to hit 100, oil's going to hit 100, and everyone would go crazy, and they'd be cheering and likes and shares and tweets and all this stuff. And I remember thinking, yeah, I'm not ready for a $100 oil yet. <laughs> I want just the market to balance out because I just don't want to go through another downturn. And so I want stability in the market. And I think we're finally at a spot now that even the people who are bullish on the market, they're really excited that even them, that they, they seem to be uh, uh, not talking about this magical $100 oil market anymore. It's just, it's just general positivity, like you said. Yes. Yeah, I think people are uh, hopeful for oil being in the, the $70 range. Right. Um, 
I've even heard some people say that the days of $100 oil are over. Uh, I'm not going to rule that out entirely for the future. Uh, but yeah, that is an easy way for people to get likes on social media posts, um, but not necessarily uh, with data to back it up. No, I think you're right. It is it is one of those things where people can get, you know, like you said, likes. And it's it's kind of depressing for me because one of the things that you'll see in this market is people are holding out for jobs. And, and I don't see it so much now, but especially the first quarter of this year, I see people holding out for jobs because they weren't getting their old day rate or their old pay or whatever it was. And my kind of thought was, Ugh, you know what? I, I would go ahead and take that job now because I just don't think the market, it may hit 100 again, like you say, but it's just not, there's no real the path to get to 100 right now, if you just said, okay, today's July 17th when we're recording this, the path for us to get to 100 our oil, it's a really scary path because a lot of bad things that we don't want to have to happen, happen. It's not where we can we can see um, a natural progression to 100. We're talking on war or you know, se- 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 uh, severe civil unrest. I don't see a natural path to 100 just the way the market looks today. Well, I agree with that 100%. There's not... Barring any, a, a military conflict, there's not a, a quick path to high-priced oil. Uh, as far as people holding out for jobs, I agree 100%. Um, if you're looking for work and you find something, I'd say take it because if they're willing to hire you now, somebody else will be willing to hire you when oil is higher. And if you need to change jobs or renegotiate at that time, you can. Um, and that, that way you're staying busy and staying in the industry uh, during the downturn, which I, I think – speaks well of someone who's able to stay employed when the industry is not doing well versus saying, hey, I got out, uh, waited for it to come back before getting back into it. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think one, one final thing on this we'll move on is that you see a lot of talk in the news about, you know, the day rate, mainly for rigs and stuff and where the day rate's at compared to where it was two years ago. And if you look at those numbers, the day rate for rigs, you know, it really hasn't bounced back uh, compared to where the price is. So if you look at how far the price went down, you look at how far the rigs, uh, the day rate went down. The, the price has come back, but the day rate for the rig count uh, for the rig for the rig price at least hasn't matched that. And so it, it sounds it seems like to me, you know, vendors like myself and and you guys, you know, you're sitting back going, okay, we're not going to overprice ourselves out of the market yet because we 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 won't work. And so we understand that the market's still a little volatile; it's not as stable as we want. And so we're going to have to low, keep our rates lower than maybe we maybe we won't, just because of the fact that we're not in a position to go out and say. Yes, we can de- we can demand top dollar on all of our projects. We have to be you know smart in how we do it. So unfortunately, that works down for all the employees and all the contractors in the industry. Is that the day rates haven't recovered to the oil price, so they drop you know X amount of percentage. If they haven't rebounded, well, then that just means that there's less money out there for everyone. And so I don't think anybody's getting hosed in the situation. It's just the reality of where we are. And I think the EIE is projecting fifty two dollar barrel oil all the way through next year. And if it stays in the 50 to 52 with no long-term major swings, I think prices and salaries across the board will come up and you'll see people going, getting those raises and that compensation that they were looking for. Yes, and definitely raising prices. Um, the day rates is much harder than lowering prices as far as justifying to your customers. The force of having to lower prices to stay competitive, though, has led to much more efficient uh, technology and uh, people working uh, those rigs as efficiently as possible, which has helped the companies that have been able to stay afloat with that. But I, th- I think you're right. When things stabilize and a new normal sets in, uh, people will be much more confident when hiring people back at uh, some of the older rates. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I talk to you about landline news because when I met you at NAVE, that's the, the booth you're representing there. And uh, I know you do some other stuff as well. I want to talk about that too. But Kind of give me a breakdown of Landline News. I've got the website open now, and it looks like you guys are just kind of a, you know, just a, just a source for upstream news and analysis. Yes, that, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, we have a lot of different topics. Got a little bit of something for everybody that's interested in upstream oil and gas. Uh, I come from a land background, so there's a lot of land-focused stuff in there. That also being half the name with Landline. But basically what we focus on, is news directly from oil and gas companies and from oil and gas organizations, such as ALTA and ALTA, the APL, NADOA, and their, their local chapters, talking about training events, social events, et cetera there, um, and then also directly from oil and gas companies about acquisitions, divestitures, mergers, new hires you know, of, of known people in the industry, and, and those kinds of big moves, and new companies coming onto the market, especially a lot of uh, venture capital funded companies. Now you mentioned mergers and acquisitions. 
um, earlier this year, it was just like a firestorm, you know, <laughs> this stuff was getting bought up and sold. Uh, it seems like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like the last two months, maybe, that what I've really noticed is is it's, it's strategic um, acquisitions. And what I mean by that is you'll see a company who has um, acreage over here and another company who has acreage over there. I think it was like Oxy did this this the other day. They just basically swapped acreage because it was, you know, it was better for Oxy. I think so it was to expand their units and then whoever they swapped with, I can't remember, to, to kind of expand their units. And so instead of saying, hey, you know, we're going to build, we're going we're gonna to drill here, we're going to have this big gap, we're going to drill here. Let's just go ahead and swap. Now, I thought, you know what? That's the kind of stuff that we'd like to see in, the, in this economy that's, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's $50 a barrel. It's not $100 a barrel. Um, companies are seeming to be smart right now with their money. They definitely do. Uh, people are consolidating, deciding to focus in one or two areas. As Google put it a while back, uh, thicker arrows uh, with fewer in the quiver. Uh, basically, uh, like the Halcon um, selling their interest in the Bakken earlier this month, uh, to focus on the Permian, they're basically deciding to put their egg into one basket, uh, but then really take care of that basket. And I think a big part of that is with the oil, lower oil prices, that way they're sharing less of the profits with other people. Right, and I think the other big news from the last month was Apache. You know, I mean, this has been, what, two oh, or three weeks ago. You know, they, they get out of the Canadian business. And they're saying, hey, you know what, we're going to focus every, I say everywhere else, but, you know, where, where uh, the rest of their assets. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see how that how that shakes out over the next six, eight uh, six to eight months. Have you heard any follow up from that? Um, from when they sold out, uh, was it two weeks ago now? Uh, it was. I was actually re skimming uh, their original press release on that earlier today, and, and I haven't heard any other fallout. But that that was a pretty big move. You know, one of the things I like to say is when people they talk about predicting the price is that you know it's so hard because you take that just take that Apache deal. Now that's just a very small, almost insignificant in some ways compared to the global picture of what's going on. But at least here in the U.S. and and, and, and around, that's going to have impact on you know on how um, drilling is going to be done. And so it's so hard to kind of look at the market and to figure out what's going to be happening because you know you wake up one morning and now Apache sold and you you know if you're not familiar with who they sold um, who they sold to, well then you don't really know what they're going to do and how much cash they have to go drill. So it, it's the market's so fluid right now, and you know you're looking at the banks, you're looking at cash, you're looking at all this stuff. And I'm really curious, the second quarter numbers about to come out. What have you heard? Have you heard much about what the second quarter numbers for these producers are going to look like? I have not heard too much. Um, I, I, I'm still thinking about that Apache deal, <laughs> and I know they've got Alpine High to focus on. I know a lot of people are hopeful of gas prices going up, but I guess I've just uh, kind of ignored some of the forecasts on, on what those production numbers, what people think those production numbers are going to be. Well, no, it's one of those things where there's so much to pay attention to. It's hard to really get a grasp of everything, isn't it? Yes. I I decided uh, to focus more on what just happened or what's happening right now as opposed to and just letting the future come when it comes. Absolutely. Uh, that was just a decision I made earlier this year. Hey, well, I, <laughs> I don't blame you one bit. You mentioned gas prices. I saw the EIA come out with a stat the other day that said even though natural gas was the most volatile in its price swings, at least as far as percentage points goes, it's one of the few energy commodities that actually has made money compared to where it started at the beginning of the year. And I, and I found that quite interesting because natural gas, you don't really hear about it that much anymore. You hear about LNG, part of natural gas, but you don't hear about natural gas production. But I think that's a great example of the, a market who, you know, it was really high. It had a bubble, the bubble bust and, or burst, and then now it's kind of leveled off. And it's, I mean, you see the swings in there can be within, you know, a dollar or so, but it, it, it is kind of in this area where producers know where it's going to be at, for at least for the foreseeable future, it seems. Yes. Yeah, I think people are, are betting more on, on gas than they have been. There was a big switch, like you said, the bubble burst, and you had some people that were very gas-focused, uh, diversifying, as it were, into oil, um, even though they were producing both beforehand, but uh, deciding to spend more money on oil with oil being higher at that time, and, and now it's kind of slung back. Uh, one more thing about the website. Um, you have a newsletter that you guys send out, I think, weekly. For the listeners that might want to go and check out LandlineNews.com, they can also get the, uh, the newsletter. What would they get in the newsletter? Uh, the newsletter has a weekly roundup of news that's happened, uh, deals, uh, the acquisitions, mergers they were talking about, updates on changes in the law, uh, state-by-state and federal basis, as well as upcoming events where people can get education um, or maybe uh, if there's any social events going on with the different organizations that I listed earlier, and then also any prospects that we have listed for sale, we do allow uh, users to put up acreage, uh, work interest, mill interest, royalty interest, override, 
that they are marketing. Uh, we do that as, as no fee or no no cost for that service, and those do go out in the newsletter as well. Great. Sounds like it's packed full of information. Um, I want to talk about uh, open, ser- open source software. Now, this is something that you're into, and I'm not a I mean, I manage the website we're at globalenergymedia.com, but it's it's WordPress and it's plug and play for the most part. And when it doesn't work, I've got to spend about four or five hours Googling trying to figure out what, what to do here. But you, you seem to be more on the tech side of things. How does open source software play into the oil and gas industry right now? I love open source and I love WordPress in particular. Um, but I think as far as the industry in general is going, they're trusting it more. Um, I've been a fan of, of open source software for a while, but we're seeing because of the need to cut costs and the fact that uh, the FOSS uh, ecosystems have a low startup cost, uh, we're seeing uh, more companies invest in that, uh, investing being mostly time, people getting trained to use it and build those systems, but they're able to build robust, uh, economic, and flexible, scalable systems, whether it's something simple that's you know a web-based PHP front end with MySQL or PostGRE on the back end, or something that they've decided to base a whole department on, like going with a map server or geo server uh, based web map instead of the traditional Arc server system. Now, now for our listeners who might be in oil and gas or any other energy um, spectrum, they might be going, "Okay, open source. Uh, that that sounds like it's something that I can get in there. You know, you know, there's a lot of maybe contributors that I could find. But is it secure? It is. Um, I, if you go with the big names, um, you're definitely um, much safer." than some of the emerging uh, open source technologies. Everything starts small. But when you look at something like uh, a Red Hat or an Ubuntu-based web server, uh, an open office office system, like I was talking with the Geo server uh, mapping system, it, you're, you're looking at some pretty secure systems. As far as databases go, I, I like MySQL, and it's it's got a lot of security functions uh, built into it and functions that you can put on top of that. Absolutely. Well, look, I will see you here in just a few weeks at the NAEP summer event. And, um, you know, let's sit down, maybe record another podcast and just kind of give the listeners what we thought about the summer NAEP compared to what we saw just, you know, was it four or five months ago now? Time's kind of flown on me. I can't remember. But um, we saw the NAEP back in, was it February? I can't remember now. It's, it's uh, or January. Yes. Yeah. But what we saw. It was either late February or early February. Yeah. 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 So let's sit down maybe at, the, at that event or right after and record us a podcast and kind of give our thoughts on what we thought, what were some, some of the big takeaways, because you know, this is such a moving market that it's really hard to uh, keep your finger on the pulse. And so uh, I encourage, encourage your listeners to go to landlinenews.com, check out the website, and also subscribe to the newsletter because, it, you know, I spend, I have, a, I use Feedly, I think is my, my big thing. I use Feedly and I get, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of articles that you try to digest through on a daily basis. And it, it's so tough. So it's nice to have services like this where you can get a, you can get an inbox, uh, you get it to your inbox on a weekly basis. And as you mentioned, there's also opportunity to invest in acreage. Yes, yes. And, and I would enjoy doing another podcast with you at that time. That'd be great. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on. And we will link to landlinenews.com in the show notes. Is there anything else that you want to plug or promote before we let you get off here today? I'd say Landline News. Um, there's plenty of other cool stuff out there. Um, but yeah, let's just focus on Landline News for now. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll link to that in the show notes. And for the listeners, you can find that at globalenergymedia.com. And I would imagine, since Kyle's on the program, he will probably put it on Landline News as well. So, Kyle, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you very much, man. Thanks again to Kyle for coming on and look forward to seeing him at NAEP and you at NAEP. If you're coming to NAEP, send me an email, ryan at globalenergymedia.com. Would love to hear from you. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global. 